Whenever we stop in various towns, like we're going to be stopping in Stratford, and we're going to be stopping in York, you can always go to what we call an estate agent, or so real estate, you know, sell buying and ha selling houses. Look in the window, get the free brochures, and they will tell you the areas uh, of, uh, you know, the prices for that particular area. Even within a particular area, prices will vastly be different depending on the what they consider the good fashionable side of town and the not so fashionable side of town maybe near the railway station or that sort of thing and so uh, pro property prices uh, is pretty um, pretty difficult to give a, an estimate however I can tell you one thing uh, property is expensive over here compared to what you get I know in Australia and the states property is a cheap when I, get, I usually go to the states at least once a year in the winter uh, and I visit friends there, and I've got friends who live outside Phoenix in Glendale, and they live in this beautiful two-garaged uh, house, front yard, backyard. They could have had a pool, but they don't. Uh, they've got four bedrooms, air conditioning throughout, massive uh, lounge, den, office, kitchen, and oh, they've got the works. That over here would be like a million pound bracket at least. Uh, at least. Uh, but over there, I mean, they, they, they pay nothing for it. So uh, I'm really quite jealous. But over here, our houses are very, very small. These cottages, the thatch cottages, which we're passing now, um, they're very cute, as you see, little chocolate box places. They'll be quite expensive because of the thatch. Even though they're on this road, they don't have much land with them. And they're probably only two bedrooms or um, maybe three at a squeeze, and very small bedrooms and maybe only one bathroom. But because this is now we're coming into the Cotswolds. The Cotswolds is an area a little bit high up, elevated that's what wold means it's a high sort of rolling hill area and this is cotswold stone and cots the word cots came from the medieval time um, times and it means pens wooden pens because this area looked totally different five six hundred years ago and before they wouldn't have had these trees they wouldn't have had fields it would have been one vast expanse of grassland and they would have grazed sheep here sheep was the wolf or the the lion of the Cotswold because it gave strength to the area it gave richness to the area we used to shear the sheep we used the wool sent it to Flanders and we clothed on the backs of the sheep of the Cotswolds virtually all of Europe so we got a very good price so people like Henry VIII and his father Henry VII and before that Richard III and so on all the medieval kings got very very wealthy with the trade with Europe from Cotswolds where we're in now so the people here the farmers the merchants who lived here were relatively wealthy they had good solid income and they built with local stone and the local stone is a type of limestone if you want to get really technical it's authentic my lime, uh, limestone <laughs> the sun's not out but anyway and if you look over towards the left hand side you see a tall tower that's the, the Shakespeare Memorial Theatre which has just undergone a big revamp only opened last year after being closed for several years and this is the home of the Royal Shakespeare Company now it's designed it was built in eight uh, sorry 1932 the old one the Victorian one was burnt down in 1926 and that was unusual because it was built by a woman. I say unusual, I'm not being sexist, but in, to be an architect, top of your profession, a woman in the 1930s and 1920s and 30s was not an easy. So she was a very, very clever woman, did very, very well to beat all the men. And she built that, uh, that uh, theatre, which we're going to go past in a moment. But um, it was revamped and redone. And what they've done now is they've done away with the old proscenium arch and they've brought out the stage into the centre. So when you go to a play there now, you're sitting in the round. You're literally surrounding on three sides of the stage. It juts out into the auditorium like it would have done in Shakespeare's day. Now here's the first statue we're going to see. We're going to go up across the bridge here. I'm going to go to the left. But here's the first statue of William. And you see characters. There you see Falstaff. You see Hal, young Hal, carrying on and trying on it more. But uh, anyway, this is the theatre. Now then, there is a little bit of the old uh, Victorian theatre left, and they have small productions where there's, um, like they do all sorts of plays, not necessarily Shakespeare, but this is the old Victorian building coming up. And they might have an audience of about 50 or 60. Big Pantechnic and they're delivering things here. But this is the old building yes. on the left-hand side. And it's haunted. 
and they, the ghost loves Chekhov plays. If he likes the performance, he uh, if he doesn't like the performance, he slams doors and makes noises, interrupts the performance. And if he likes it all, maybe she, he fills the auditorium with a scent, a beautiful perfume. So I like to think that the ghost is heaven sent. Pub here, Dirty Duck. Look at that pub there on the right. What are the other name? It's called the Dirty Duck, or the White, or the Black Swan. So it's got two names. We don't really know. But, uh, and that's where a lot of the actors, uh, after the performance, they go to and have a drink. So if you if you ever stay in Stratford overnight, night, hang out till about eleven o'clock, and you go in there and you sometimes see famous people from the stage because the Royal Shakespeare Theatre has all the best actors and actresses of British theatre performing here from time to time. Now we're going to go straight on here. Now unfortunately because it's the summer or coming into summer, we're late spring, we can't see the church where he was buried. Well, there's a beautiful memorial theatre donated by the Americans. It's the Seven Ages of Man, which was taken from Shakespeare's theme. And Shakespeare's buried in the main nave of the, of the church. <coughs> along with Suzanne, his daughter, and along with his wife, Anne Hathaway. His daughter, Judith, and his son, Hamnet, are buried in the graveyard. We don't know where. Lost. But the church, we're going to turn right, but the church is off to the left here. Through the trees, you might see a bit of a churchyard and all some old stones there. The church spire is there. You can't get large vehicles like this down there. But Judith, sorry, uh, Suzanne married a very good doctor, Dr. Hall. He lived in this building. We're going to go slowly where you see the wisteria growing out, the purple flower. This was the Dr. Hall's Croft. It's now a museum because he used to, was a doctor. In those days, they didn't have any knowledge. They used to grow herbs and spices, herbs for herbal remedy. So they lived here. That garden, that area there to the right, is where he grew all his homo homopathy, isn't it? What they call it, you know, natural. Uh, that's what he would have been a good doctor at. But he was very, very well respected. And Suzanne died when she was 66 years old, which was actually quite a good age. I'm going to go down here, sorry, sorry, to the right. <laughs> um, sorry, Paul, it's my fault. Uh, we're going to come up to the grammar school where Shakespeare was educated. And, and not the girls, his daughters didn't go here because it was a bit of girls only. This is the school here, right where the book boys are, the girls there, are on the right hand side. Now, Shakespeare, when he came back, he had a big lot of money, he had a big house. So he built the big house where there's a big mound of earth in the garden. They'll tell you the story about that later. It's no longer there, it doesn't exist anymore. It was knocked down. We're actually digging to find out what was underneath there. His granddaughter lived in that house there, the black and white Nash house on the right hand side. Shakespeare's house, when he built, he built the biggest place, it's called.
after there would have been a time for such a word tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time and all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death out out grief can go life's but a walking shadow a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more That's where the three-legged mare was. Three-legged mare was a triangle on its side, imagine, and each point it was a, they had a pole going down into the ground. So you could hang about nine people, three on each arm of the triangle at once. The three-legged mare, it was called. Dick Turpin was there. 1739, he was hung. Being hung in the 18th century was not a pleasant way to go. It was slow strangulation. They didn't, they didn't know, they didn't think, they didn't have the technology for the drop to break your neck immediately. And so it was a, not a very nice way to go. But that was a great place to take your family for a day out. No bingo, no cinemas, so you took them to public executions. And uh, that's what they did there. That was the site of execution, the three-legged mare outside the city walls. Now, the city walls are very much in evidence. We're going to see them quite shortly as we go into the town. They're preserved. They're, some of them are on the base of the old Roman walls, but that what you see is actually medieval. And... Uh, they were very, very important. It was only the development of gunpowder that could blast through the walls that they became redundant. But for some reason, like most of our cities, our old, old cities, would have had uh, city walls. Only Chester and York had actually preserved them. A lot of them pulled them down. They wanted to pull them down because they thought, well, after the Civil War, after the 1600s, gunpowder, now with a unified uh, country between England and Scotland, there was no threat of war. We don't need city walls. And so the city gateways, the city walls were knocked down. But here, we kept them. And the first, what we're going to see, the first gateway, we can't just see yet, but in another, get through these lights in a couple of hundred yards, you're going to see the Micklebar Gate. This is the royal entrance. This was the main way into town, into the city in the uh, throughout history still is today it's the main ceremonial route into into york and so uh, the micklebar gate and now we used to have heads of executed uh, prisoners on the uh, uh, not ordinary prisoners. the ones who were hung were riffraff they were out there in the race course but political prisoners pe people who've done treason for example against the king and government would have their heads cut off and we're going to make our way around the city walls. And you're going to see the city walls. And I'm going to point you in the right direction. This is probably a bit too far to come from the area where we are, the other side of the river. But I'm going to point out a gateway where you can see a gateway similar to this. These are called Barbicans, or in York speak, we call them bars, B-A-R.